well, we've got a challenge. It's, <laughs> it's been a long day, I know. So bear with me. Um, hopefully in 15 minutes, I'll be able to share with you a story um, about the, the Gulf of Carpentaria, a little bit off the, the track of the East Coast, I appreciate. Um, but this was a special project that uh, arose in response to an issue. And the issue was uh, the evidence showing that there was mass dieback of mangroves. Uh, so this Nest hub, uh, along with the the uh, Northern Australia Hub <clears throat> uh, and others contributed significant funding to investigate this issue, in other words, identify the cause um, and, and then ultimately to, uh, well, to explain uh, why this occurrence um, was there. Um, that makes it special in other ways. It, it also says that we came in without uh, the immediate prerequisite of, of having partners uh, in industry or other stakeholders, um, and we've had to basically, uh, in raising the issue, to um, embrace people's interests uh, a a into the program. Uh, I've done this work with uh, a number of uh, collaborators, but my primary collaborator was Jock McKenzie, who's now with Earthwatch Australia. Um, and others uh, at Charles Darwin University um, and the Bureau of Meteorology uh, and others um, also with the uh, uh, World Animal uh, Protection Group because uh, we're looking at ghost nets and things because we, uh, in the process of this work, created surveys of shorelines, 2,000 kilometres of shoreline, as it turned out, uh, I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a, in a tick. Um, and, of course, uh, CSIRO, uh, who are also interested in ghost nets, et cetera, washed up on beaches. So, um, let's have a look. Just to run through the facts, uh, or the brief, in very brief terms, of, of, we're in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Uh, the event occurred September, November 2000. 15. Uh, you'll have heard the date uh, 2016, raised with corals bleaching. Uh, it's the same El Nino. It just happened earlier for mangroves, the dieback in this case. The length of shoreline affected 2,000 kilometres from Weeper to Blue Mud Bay that's shown on the map. In other words, basically all the Gulf. Um, uh, the area of mangroves lost was 76 square kilometres of mangroves killed. That's uh, quite a lot of trees. Uh, in fact, about three, um, more than three million trees, probably a lot more. Um, it's hard to estimate. The, and, and a lot of carbon to boot, so there's a huge story there. The main species affected was Avicinia marina, uh, a common mangrove in most cases, but especially so uh, in dry, tropical parts of Australia. It also grows around southern Australia, a different variety, but the same species. Um, there was no concurrent uh, or widespread direct human influence, so we know it wasn't things that people were doing directly. But we, we do know that the uh, climate uh, and variables like that were implicated. At the time, this is in two, uh, 2017 or 2016 when it was first detected, um, uh, we believe that this was unprecedented. But you'll see from the title of the talk that it wasn't. And so just to go through uh, the findings of the uh, project, the achievements we're talking about in um, that when we, uh, after the initial exploration work, which wasn't part of NESP, uh, was done. In fact, it was the precursor work. We knew that there was damage from Karumba across to you know, the Northern Territory side of the Gulf. Um, but that's been extended. Uh, with the NEST program, that the impact was much wider, so we're getting to that 2,000 kilometres of shoreline. And uh, we're talking about 
uh, that, well, to, to gauge this effects, uh, we, we, we did surveys in 2017 uh, where we filmed the entire shoreline, uh, et cetera, and analysed the, you know, sh metre by metre well, how, what conditions or what changes were taking place on these shorelines as well as indicating where the 2015 dieback was. Um, and in the process of this, we also set up, uh, well, I should mention there were four major areas of significant dieback of 100% loss of shoreline fringe, and we're talking about 100 metres or more wide of mangrove fringes that were lost in these areas. I'll show a picture in a minute. Um, but we, these areas were spread across the Gulf. Um, and at these same sites, we also set up uh, two transects uh, at each to go from the sea profile up to the land and measured every tree uh, in a strip uh, and also measured elevation across the profile so that we could somehow gain enough evidence to sort of uh, link to what the possible cause might be. But in the process, we also have recently gone further and have also looked at sites across northern Australia, uh, all the tropics, all the way from, uh, well, Moreton Bay on the east right across to Carnarvon on the uh, west coast. And uh, of those sites, we found that there was dieback uh, at both Joseph Bonaparte Gulf site and at Exmouth. So we suspect and probably have a good reason to believe that the dieback uh, was present uh, along that entire section of shoreline. Now, this is not the extreme, the 100% loss. This is the lesser amounts of, of dieback. And what I mean is that where you've got a retreat from an ecotone uh, at the back of the mangrove forest. Um, but one thing I want to draw on this slide, uh, draw attention to, is that the East Coast was not affected by the same uh, event. Um, and we suspect it has got a lot to do with the climate that it's got less rainfall on the, uh, on the western side and in the Gulf. Uh, and so uh, that may well be a contributing factor. And the other point about this, I talked about the zonation effect, the ecotone. Um, where the di in the mangrove forests of the Gulf and in most of semi-arid parts of, of, the, uh, of the Australian northern coastline, you, you have two distinct zones of mangroves. You've got the, the shoreline zone, and then you've got the landward zone, and in between a big salt pan or a marsh. Um, and this can be a kilometre or more wide, so it's, it's, uh, it's quite distinctive. Um, but the dieback itself was at the, either uh, the entire shoreline zone or the rear of that zone. So it's a very distinctive pattern in doing aerial surveys. You can see exactly where this is. And I should just point out briefly that the elevation from, uh, of the dieback across that zone, uh, of the dieback zone, um, where it was about uh, uh, 40 centimetres. Okay, and this is on average between those eight transects that we looked at across the, across the Gulf in those four major sites. And this is, this is typical of a semi-arid zone. Okay. So this is a, a, a couple of, well, three graphs, um, but, well, it's more than three. They're, they've got some overlapping ones. I don't want that to be too scary, but, the, but underlying the top two graphs is the, uh, the Southern Oscillation Index, the SOI. So the line that goes from one side to the other on there. Um, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm pushing the wrong button. All right. Um, okay. Everyone see this line? Here's the SOI. And the darker line uh, is the, um, the mean sea level. But what you notice about those two lines is they virtually overlap each other, right? I mean, it's SOI uh, for this is a site uh, of the sea level at Corumba in the Gulf. Um, they almost perfectly match. So from the point of view of predicting, you know, like, uh, for example, in 2015, where the right uh, side, you've got a red line, uh, that's when the event of dieback occurred. There was just another on the SOI, if you're using it as a proxy of sea level, uh, showing that there was another 
possible occurrence of sea level, but there was no records of mangroves dying in 1982, okay? Um, and so it was... It was, a, it was a challenge to, to see if there was any relationship there. But I should want to go further with this uh, image of graphs, because in the lower one you've got the SOI again, but this time you've got mean sea level um, running at the six-month averages, and you can see that now you've got an annual uh, periodicity uh, measured in this uh, relationship as opposed to a long-term view of, of mean sea level variation when you do a 12-month running average, uh, showing that there's two kinds of uh, oscillations going on in this same set of sea level data, and obviously it's influenced by that SOI in the first place. So uh, when we get to the lower set of graphs, we've now got the sea level curve, which is the dark one here, running at the six-month running average, um, but you can see that the spotty uh, series of data is in fact the density of mangrove canopies measured at a single dot point over time. So we're going through, but it's on that transect uh, of, of uh, where we did the field work. And what you can see there is a slow transition from a low value coming up to a maximal value and bouncing around here following, well, this, this sea level uh, curve. Uh, and then when we get to 2015, <coughs> just drops, and then it starts to grow again uh, in recovery. But I just want to emphasize that it was low here, uh, it, and in fact, consistent with the idea that there probably was dieback earlier, even though it wasn't recorded. Uh, that, remember, it was 76 square kilometres, like it wouldn't be hard to miss, you'd think, but, but clearly, uh, well, I'm suggesting it was. And, and that goes further. OK. Uh, so, OK, I've got these relationships with the Southern Oscillation Index. You've got the extreme... Uh, in, in, and then the relationship with uh, uh, mean sea level and then mean sea level related to the mangrove canopies varying over time. And you've got these two cycles. One is the long-term cycle, <clears throat> and then the other is the annual cycle. Now, the question is, uh, OK, so from the remote sensing that we were able to gather, there was, you could get annual uh, or monthly representations after 1987, but... but uh, uh, <clears throat> So, but, so you could easily pick the uh, exact timing of the 2015 event, but earlier, as we can see, we can span the period of 1982 um, by, you know, by these photos in uh, 1978 and 1989. So again, consistent this time, uh, clear evidence that there were mangroves before, it wasn't a newly established mangroves that were growing. So, so we can propose that there's this collapse and recovery cycle going on in the Gulf with a 33-year period between collapse events. The question, that, well, two things. One is that there was recovery after the 1982 event, um, and, but in 2015, we're not sure of what, how that's going to be. So we don't know what uh, the future is, but we don't think it's very good because, uh, for example, there was a severe tropical cyclone in <clears throat> December 2018, um, which if you can see there in October, when we were there in a field uh, trip in uh, 2018, there, there, there were standing dead trees from the 2015 event. And in the uh, period when we came back in 2019, uh, September, those trees were completely flattened. The whole area looked like it had been bulldozed. There were piles of driftwood of all those dead trees from 2015, and there were projectiles piling up on surviving vegetation as well as uh, actually uh, acting as scourings of the salt marsh and things uh, that had occurred before. So um, there's big changes going on. And of course, this area is an area of maximal sea level rise, 
Um, so there's nothing now to resist the changes of, of you know, the hydrodynamic changes of, of those rising sea levels. The mangroves would usually suppress that. We do know that mangroves are normally good at um, uh, slowing down sea level or at least accommodating to sea level rise in the Gulf. We can see the demography of the trees that from the sea edge to the, to the inner edges, the trees get younger as you go uh, from the sea edge and up the profile. So this is showing that there's a clear migration taking place in those trees. But obviously this event in 2015 uh, that's caused a serious disruption. Um, I wanted to briefly show you the... Uh, <laughs> I'm also going over time a bit, so just uh, feel free. Um, but I just want to point out that there were um, uh, different ways of looking at this data, and I wanted to draw attention to the fact that you can see in these wiggly spaghetti graphs, um, this is a comparison of... Uh, the, uh, the canopy condition compared to the sea level stress index, if you like, that's measured just on the sea level variations, and these are obviously the lows and these are the highs, but you can see that the, the variations are occurring, they're fluctuating backwards and forwards, but then they collapse. Well, now, if you take the anomaly of sea level, uh, sorry, the canopy, and put it over time, you can see that there is also a, a, a very strong correlation so that we can see in that that the, uh, if you look at the monthly data, that this is varying um, according to the months. So it, it's very, uh, a repeated annual cycle so that every, um, uh, well, I, there's tiny little numbers in there, but the, uh, but the thing is that it, it's the same of things happening every year. You get the, the drop uh, sorry, at the low end where you got the low, oh, well, you can see it. I mean, it, it, there's lows and there's uh, highs, and, 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 the, and the highs are always at the same month every year, and the lows are at the same month every year. And basically, you can reduce that to a simple diagram uh, where you can see this variation going on. So I'm liking this to a Goldilocks period, which is, oh, sorry, a sweet spot for mangroves uh, with sea level, that they fit in this green zone and that where you get to extremes, extreme high, you can get dieback. And when you get to extreme lows, you get dieback. And the top one, where, they, where it's high, it's about drowning. Uh, and then when you go down to the low, uh, they die there. So you've got this uh, very, well, unprecedented, <laughs> unknown, unrecognised process going on uh, in tidal wetlands that has direct correlations with coral bleaching and seagrass uh, dieback uh, because of its relationship to the Southern Oscillation Index and the variations that we see there. And that's the point I want to draw on that. So we can explain mangrove zonation, we can explain seasonality in the mangroves where we can see that the phenology of the mangroves is such that leafing occurs at the exact same months every year and it matches uh, uh, the high sea levels and that the low sea levels leaves fall off the trees. So we've got this very strong driving mechanism. This has not been known or ever reported on in science. So, so these are significant observations of and a means to understand uh, how these systems are functioning uh, where we haven't had that understanding before. And we can use that information. So if you, we, can, uh, uh, we can prevent it, we feel, just by knowing that water is the limitation. So if you water the trees, there's a possibility you can use that information. That needs to be properly worked through. Um, we also know that we, we have to remove other impacts. We've heard a lot about feral pigs. We've heard a lot about uh, the damage they cause. Uh, that needs to be reduced as well because those things are preventing the trees from surviving, these wetlands surviving as well. Um, and of course, there are other factors there. So briefly, thank you very much.